Chris Hensley is a registered representative of Cambridge Investment Research, Inc., a broker-dealer member of FINRA, SIPIC, investment advisor representative of Cambridge Investment Research Advisors, Inc., a registered investment advisor. Cambridge and Houston First Financial Group are not affiliated. Good morning, everybody. You're listening to Money Matters on KPFT Houston. I'm Chris Hensley. The time is now 11 a.m. is what I'm so used to saying each and every Friday, but yet we are recording live from my bedroom again. (laughs) Uh, And uh, during uh, COVID and during the pandemic, we are doing these these pre-recorded shows. And so uh, the the benefit of that is we're actually get, we have a YouTube version of this that we've been putting out. And so uh, you'll get two versions of that. You'll get the podcast that will be on the website, but you'll also get the YouTube version. Uh, if you are a longtime listener, you know that we always reserve just the first few moments of the show to tell you a little bit about what's going on in the Houston uh, and the Gulf Coast area when it comes to uh, financial literacy. Uh, and so I was hoping to have an update for you on Houston Money Week, which is officially kicked off. And we know each and every year uh, in April, we have Houston Money Week uh, for free financial literacy workshops in the Houston and the Gulf Coast area. However, uh, the meeting for that took place during the freeze that happened here in Texas last week. So uh, as I was as part of the leadership team looking to join in, uh, the bulk of Houstonians here were without power and, uh, and electricity and heat and experiencing snow. Um, all I can say is that hopefully I'll be able to give you an update next month. And if you've been following Houston Money Week, you know that we've been very big for uh when we talk about savings and preparing uh, hurricane preparation in the Gulf Coast, that's just part of it. You, you know, keep your bottled water, uh, all of those things that we prepare for these storms on the golf course. Nobody had a snow or ice storm on our radar. <laughs> just not something we think about here in Houston, but it happens. So um, I'm sure when we get back to updating with you with Houston Money Week, you will hear that theme of preparing uh, disaster preparedness. Uh, the things that we don't have, uh, you know, you can put a good financial plan in place, but flooding, uh, hurricanes, snowstorms, things like that, those are the things that are on the back of our mind that aren't necessarily on our radar. With that, we have Laura, who has been patiently waiting. Laura is the author of the book, uh, The Business of We. And I want to talk about this uh, in the wake of Black Life Matters mo- movement, the COVID-19 pandemic, and a contentious presidential election. People across a diversity of ge- geographies, ethnicities, races, genders, generations, faiths and political views have to work exceptionally well together for the sake of not only economic recovery, but America's future. Inspiring, pragmatic, and packed with helpful examples and tools, the business of we is an indispensable guide to start us moving forward. The author, uh, Laura Kriska, is here with us today. Laura, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. And uh, for listeners who aren't familiar with you, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Well, I'll start by saying that uh, I help companies build diverse and inclusive organizations without spending any money. So that's kind of my life's mission. And I started by uh, being interested in foreign cultures. I was actually born in Japan. Oh, wow. (laughs) Yeah, I was born in Japan. Nihon de umaremashita. That, that means I was born in Japan. Nice. Uh, my parents were missionaries there. Um, but I was only there till I was two. I grew up in Columbus, Ohio. I'm going to say I have a, a soft spot uh, for Houston. I travel there. I used to travel there a lot. In fact, my very last business trip was last February to Houston. And... I miss having those opportunities. So hi, Houston. I miss you. Well, hello. Little did we know the very next month, nobody would be traveling for quite some time. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Um, But I grew up, you know, unlike Houston, I mean, Houston's one of the most diverse cities in America. Uh, I I grew up in Columbus, Ohio. Columbus is more diverse now than when I grew up, but I grew up in a very non-diverse community. Um, you know, mostly white people who looked like me, who sounded like me, who, you know, the big difference was uh, kids in my school who were Catholic versus the non-Catholic kids. That that was the big divide, if there was any cultural divide. Um, 
but I was very interested in different cultures. And my junior year of college, I lived in Japan. And then after college, I wanted to get a job working in Japan. And I was very lucky because Honda Motor Company had um, made a huge factory in, in, Japan, in Ohio. And I got a job working for Honda and they sent me to the Tokyo headquarters. I was wow. 22, 22 years old, completely clueless, but at the same time, completely full of myself. Do you remember yourself at that time, Chris? I, don't know. I do, yes. <laughs> 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 you know, looking back, I think, you know, I really had no business going to Japan, but also it was because I was so naive and so full of myself that I thought I could manage it and handle it. And I had a lot of cultural encounters, you know, that didn't work out very well. And part of that was because I thought I knew what I was doing. I had the idea about myself that I'm open-minded. I'm a global person. You know, I spent some time in Japan. I love Japan. I was very eager to go there. No one was forcing me to go to Japan. And part of the problems that resulted occurred because I was so full of myself. I, I just thought that I understood everything. I thought that proximity to people who were different, I thought that a little bit of familiarity, which really was only on the surface, would be enough and that's not enough. And that relates to the we building idea that I have that I'm trying to share with people is that proximity to people who are different is good. It's better than no proximity. Um, words saying, hey, I wanna do better or we've gotta have a more diverse organization. That's also better than not saying it, but it's not close to being enough. And that's what we building is about. It's about practical tools. Um, so when I worked in Japan, I suffered some of the same things I see people today suffering from, um, the inability to connect, uh, the concern that I might say or do the wrong thing, you know, knowing, oh, I, I need to do better, but I definitely don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. I don't want to get into legal trouble. Um, so I had very, you know, I had those same kind of struggles. And through the process of working that out for myself and figuring out how to navigate a cultural group that felt very different from the cultural group that I associated with, um, I learned lessons. And then I started a career helping other people to navigate different cultural groups. Um, and so that led me to a consulting career for over 25 years around the globe, working with thousands of people. Um, and that actually brought me back to thinking about America and thinking about the great cultural divisions we have in our country. Uh, because I started thinking about culture not as internationally related, which you know is one way, but I think of it much more broadly. Cultural differences and cultural groups can be defined by any aspect of a per person's identity. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I love it. What a great experience to really kind of come out of the culture shock that you mentioned of be, being a, a, a young 22 year old in this in this culture and kind of I don't say thrown to the wolves, but kind of having to go out there and uh, do this. And then fast forward uh, to the book, the, the Business of We. Uh, why did you write The Business of We? I wrote The Business of We to help people navigate diversity and to improve inclusion in the United States. I yeah. want our workplaces, but also our communities, um, to be much more uh, inclusive, to be, I, I'm, I want to help people connect with those who are different from themselves. It, the ability to connect, to really build trusting relationships with people who look different, sound different, pray different, you know, whatever the difference is, um, has really been missing, I find. It, there are examples where people have connections, meaningful connections, but they tend to be very narrow opportunities or very minimal in someone's life. And we just need so much more of it. Um, and so the business of we, I mean, it's written as a business book, Chris, but it, it is not at all limited to the business community. Yeah. I learned the tools that I share from people who work in business, but these tools can be applied by any person who's interested in building connection, 
any person who wants to uh, narrow gaps, any yeah. person who's sick and tired of the divisiveness in our country who yearns for more unity will benefit from reading this book because it is full of practical tips that people can start using today um, to build a more unified, cohesive community. I love it. I love it. I, I mean, everything. I've always considered I, I, our diversity one of our greatest strengths, but it can be a roadblock. And we think of organizations and uh, even geographically. I mean, we're in a state like I, I'm working remotely now <laughs> and having to manage a staff. So we've got geographical, you know, physical differences, uh, political ideologies. The past year have been uh, just this is this is a very important time for people to hear this information. One of the things that you say in the book, you talk about diversity can be divisive. Um, tell us a little bit about that. I, I think any objective examination of the history of America shows you that people see difference, see, uh, for example, racial difference, ethnic difference, even things like age difference, you know, okay, boomer, right? That whole uh, thing. That when that there is a a kind of inherent worry people have, they I guess uh, psychologists or sociologists call this intergroup anxiety. So there's a part part of this divisiveness that is kind of inherent in being human. You you feel maybe out of place. You know, intergroup anxiety is simply that feeling of, um, you know, your heart is racing, you might start to sweat and just think, do I belong, right? Do I belong? It, it's such a primary question for humans. And our history in the United States of prioritizing basically one racial group, one socioeconomic group, uh, one gender group, uh, you know, when our country was founded, it was really for, you um, land owning white men. And that social group has maintained power in the United States and there is a default. So in the book, I talk about the idea of a home team. You know, every country, every organization, you know, has a home team and the home team establishes the norms. So in America, in corporate America, even today, there is a home team, and I would describe that home team as middle-aged white men. So if you belong to that group, and I almost belong, right? I'm a middle-aged white woman, so I'm very close to fully belonging to that group. Um, but when you belong to that group, norms are set around the things that you are already familiar with. There is a default to us. And while some people may fail to recognize that, it's a real thing. You know, I called the home team because, you know, what does a home team have? An advantage, right? So in, in any kind of sports, you when you're on the home team, you understand the landscape, you understand the rules, you, you know where the best pizza place is. You know, there's all kinds of things you just inherently know when you're part of that home team. So in an organization, the idea of belonging to a home team means that um, people who don't identify with it are at a disadvantage. So they're marginalized in some way. Um, so this concept is really important for people to recognize, I think. Even if they don't feel like they've benefited, they have a team. Does that make sense? It does. It does. I've, I've heard it explained in different ways before. That is, a, I love the home team uh, metaphor there. That's uh, it's a really good way to explain it. One of the things that you talk about in the book is, you know, the benefits of bringing people together, that synergy of cross-culture compatibility. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Mm -hmm. When you have integrated communities in your workforce, it brings uh, points of view, um, new information that you just wouldn't have had otherwise. And, and really the idea of the home team and this idea of, uh, you know, seeing how different people bring something to the table really came to me clearly when I worked with Japanese companies. 
I work, I, I, my past work has mostly been with huge Japanese companies and they um, often send their top people overseas to places like Houston or New York where I live. And these are hardworking, smart, loyal people. But there tends to be, not all of them, but there tends to be a discomfort when working with non-Japanese people. Part of this is language, but part of it is also this idea that there is a norm of behavior. So when I worked with these large organizations and I saw the top management was all Japanese in some cases, I could see as I got to know the organizations, I could see that they would be missing information. For example, let's say they had non-Japanese uh, employees in Houston, but those employees weren't invited to decision-making strategy sessions about where to place their energies for new customer bases. Well, who's gonna know more about where new customers are going to come from uh, in Houston? People who have lived out in Houston and grown up in Houston and worked in Houston, or someone from a different country who is temporarily on assignment in Houston? You know, it, it didn't, it's, this is not rocket science, you know, it doesn't, right. it, but, but the intergroup anxiety uh, discomfort caused the all homogeneous home team management of the organization to fail to recognize that, oh, we should have more and more voices at our table uh, when making decisions. And, and so what I just said could be applied to this idea of corporate America where so many of the top leadership positions are occupied by middle-aged white men. And so they are making decisions based on this kind of narrow homogeneous um, group. And that is not to say that a middle-aged white man cannot be very broad-minded. I think there are many people who have educated themselves who are broad-minded and open-minded. Um, but when you have the lived experience, you know, when you are the expert, say, on Houston or on some other uh, cultural group that is relevant, you bring something unique that others may not be able to understand. Um, and I've certainly seen huge failures of organizations when they haven't done this. And let me give you an example. Mm -hmm. About two years ago, uh, Dolce and Gabbana. Um, had a huge cultural catastrophe in China. So Dolce & Gabbana, huge Italian uh, luxury brand, their growing, biggest growing market is in China and they plan an enormous, um, their largest ever fashion show in Shanghai. This is in planned for November, 2018. And to promote this, they created these um, uh, social media videos. The whole idea about these three videos was to promote the fashion show, get people excited, et cetera. But when they released these videos, there was a huge backlash because the videos ended up being really insulting to the Chinese population. And to the, the videos were, is a beautiful Chinese woman and she's eating Italian food. There are three different foods. One is spaghetti, a calzone and pizza, and she's eating them with chopsticks. The idea was to be humorous. Oh, you know, and there's a male voiceover and it's very patronizing. Oh, honey, you can't, you know. Anyway, it was meant to be humorous. It completely failed. The fashion show was canceled. But not only that, there was an enormous social media backlash. Products were uh, taken off the shelves. I mean, it has had an ongoing huge financial impact on the business. So when I saw this, I thought, okay, one of two things happened. Either they had no Chinese uh, colleague voices at the table when they were making the decision about these videos, or, so that would be a mistake, right? Having a diverse uh, people and the benefit they would have had, maybe someone would have said, you know, mm, I don't know how well that's gonna go over. Um, or they did have somebody and they didn't listen. Either way, it was a failure. And so the benefit of bringing people together is that you can consider all these different viewpoints and then make informed decisions. I'm not saying that people must do things the way another cultural group does them. What I'm saying in my book is that you need to do the work to pay attention and find out what matters to this other cultural group and then make deliberate choices so that you can avoid causing huge damage 
and actually leverage your knowledge into successful promotional videos, into successful um, uh, new innovative product decisions, into successful relationships and teamwork in your organization. I, I love it. I love it. A lot of that of what you just said makes a lot of sense. Uh, from the investment world, this just popped into my head. We have something called regional bias where when you're doing portfolio construction, if you are you know, local expert, if people can only think there or U.S. domestic. They don't think of it as a global economy and that I'm just kind of translating it to the investment side. So that kind of popped into my head when we were talking. We've, yeah. we've just talked about some of the organizational challenges and, and uh, of groups and uh, working together. But in the book, you've come up with this process to help them work through it. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that process? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The we building process has three simple steps. They're very simple. I will go through them very quickly. But I want to say that while the steps are simple, um, creating a we culture takes time and effort. It takes ongoing time and effort but it's very doable. So the three steps are first to foster awareness of culture. And that simply means that culture is not just an international experience. Um, culture can be a generational experience. I don't know about you, Chris, but I have uh, three, I'm about to have three teenagers in my house on Friday. Yeah. I'm gonna get, the third one will be 13. And Holy there's smoke. a generational <laughs> difference Thank you. <laughs> you know, generationally, there's a difference, and that is a culture gap. Um, and, and so culture gaps can be applied to any aspect of a person's identity. Um, step two is the most important tool, I think, in my book, and that is called the us versus them self-assessment. It is a series of 10 yes or no questions, and it requires a person who is trying to narrow a gap to ask themselves these 10 simple questions and just honestly reflect and answer them correctly. And so if you get a low score, it means that you're not well suited and prepared to be uh, successfully interacting with this other cultural group. And not to worry, if you get a low score, it simply means you need to uh, take some actions to build your level of integration. And notice, I didn't say agreement, right? Level of integration. You're, you're in, you need to increase your face-to-face -face interactions and have more inter interactions of increasing depth. That is how we learn about another cultural group. So this uh, self-assessment provides an immediate measuring tool for any person at any time um, in, and it will tell them how deeply integrated they are in relation to this other group. Any no answers become a potential action point for someone to increase his, her, or their own score. And then finally, the third step is the gap closing action plan. Um, and that's simply a matter of deciding, well, what am I comfortable doing? Uh, what do I have time to do? What, what, what am I going to do? I gave a TEDx talk about two years ago and the, type, the topic was how small gestures can bridge the gap between us and them. And I completely stand by that title, which is really small things are the starting point for meaningful uh, connection with people who are different. Um, so let me give you an example of that. If I was trying to um, bridge a gap with someone from a different country, uh, I could do a small effort like, uh, let's say I wanted, I'm gonna um, have a colleague from uh, in uh, Italy work with me. Maybe we're gonna be remote, like you were referring to the fact that you're remote now. And so I could invest 10, 15 minutes on Duolingo or on YouTube and learn how to introduce myself in Italian. That's it. Right. That's a pretty simple task and action that I could take so that when I virtually met this person or one day and actually meet them, I could use that uh, little bit of skill to, you know, connect a little bit rather than expecting that person only to speak in my language. So the idea of, of actions can be everything from small things that you do in private to radical choices that you dive in to another cultural group. 
um, if, you, if it's okay, I'd like to give you another example that I think is really relevant today in relation to Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. um, there are so many uh, white Americans who understand things differently now uh, as a result of what happened and what's happened in this past year about after George Floyd was murdered, the Black Lives Matter protest, and you know, so many more people now understand that um, our country is not equal. There, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And I, I have felt this way myself. I have had a kind of awakening over the past few years, but it's hard for people like this to know, what do I do? Like, I know a lot of people protested. I know people put signs up in their window and that's great. It's so great to see this, but it's not enough. <laughs> it is simply not enough to tweet something or put a sign in your window. It, it's better than not doing those things, but people who are in this category are, I think, having this intergroup anxiety and they worry. They, what do I do? I don't want to be offensive. And so I would say to them, uh, start with safe actions. Safe actions, safe we building actions are things you do in private in your own home. And they are things like listening to a podcast, like listening to the 1619 uh, Project. Um, uh, Rebecca Carroll is a, an author and activist I like to um, listen to. Come Through is a series of uh, podcasts that she did last year. Read a book, How to Be an Anti-Racist by Iber Next Kendi. Uh, you know, uh, so you want to talk about race by Ijoma Olu. You know, there's so many resources that you can do in private. Nobody has to know about it. There's no risk involved. Uh, you don't have to be vulnerable at all. So those are safe, what I call safe actions. But again, I would say safe actions are not enough. Eventually, you have to engage and you have to be willing to engage in some type of vulnerable situation where you interact face to face with people who are different and, and search for opportunities where you can uh, listen and learn from people who have the lived experience of being a black American. Um, as white Americans and as people who are concerned about what's happening and want to do more, we can educate ourselves, but one of the most important things is listening to people who have a lived experience that we will never understand. And I this is it. so important for business leaders. There are so many business leaders, again, in that group, that middle-aged white male group, who care about this, who are charged with making the decisions, but they haven't invested the time to listen to either their employees or some colleagues uh, that have the lived experience that they simply will never have. I love so it, that, I love it. Sorry, the, the last group category is this idea of radical. Radical is really just diving in. It would be joining um, a, a, a sol in solidarity, a group where you are maybe the only white person, um, where you are really putting yourself in a situation uh, that might be very uncomfortable, uh, that might have some um, risk involved in terms of you can't, you don't know what to expect. Um, but when we make those choices, uh, if I go back to the Italy example, you know, moving to Italy would be a radical choice if I'm trying to get to know that cultural group. Um, radical choices are tend to be rare, but they can be incredibly useful. I love it. You've just given several different kind of levels of small steps all the way to this radical. Uh, uh, it's really hard for people to be jerks if they sit down and talk to each other. Uh, I, so so I, I, I love this. Um, now we've got just we've got about three minutes left towards the end of the show. Uh, again, we're speaking with Laura Kriska. Uh, Laura, just as we get close to the end of the show, one of the things you talk about in moving us forward is the need for building uh, internal infrastructure. Uh, what does that mean? Tell us a little bit about that. It's one of my favorite topics. Thank you for bringing it up. It, it's simply the idea that. Um, each person inside needs to have uh, these tools. Um, so actually, let me tell you, um, the idea came to me when I thought about the um, 1991 Americans with Disability Act. 
and that when that law was put into effect, organizations had to put a lot of money and time into building a physical structure, infrastructure, uh, ramps, parking for uh, people who are disabled, uh, closed captioning, right? There's a physical infrastructure that you can see. If you walk into a building, you can see whether they've done the work or not to comply right. with this law. It is my firm position that one reason we have negligible progress in America in terms of racial equity in the business world is that the infrastructure necessary is uh, invisible. Uh, we have laws that require you know, certain practices to be in effect and, and lawyers spend tons of time and money trying to make sure people are behaving within those norms. But what you really need is to look inward and ask yourself those 10 questions because without that, people, individuals who are charged with making the decisions will not be making fully informed, correct decisions because they don't have all the information. And so I really think it's, it's critical, it's urgent that leaders, especially leaders who identify as I do with the cultural majority, the home team in American business, that each of us examine ourselves, take the 10 question quiz. You can get it for free off of my website, which is my name, you know, dot com, lauracriska.com. This one page is free, it's a free resource for anybody who wants to try now to examine and, and see, you know, what infrastructure have I really created within myself? And if I haven't done the work, what can I do today to start changing that? I love it. Well, we are right here towards the end of the show. Uh, Laura, thank you so much for being on the show. Uh, you just mentioned a free resource. I mean, we've done a lot of shows on corporate responsibility. Here's some tools for people to actually be able to, to, to take action on this. You also referenced that TED Talk, so I'll make sure in the podcast notes to include that. Is there anything that I forgot to ask you that you'd like to share with listeners today? Well, I'll say that I'm going to start offering some free webinars, um, and if people follow me on LinkedIn, that's probably the best place to learn about those webinars because I want to inspire a we-building revolution, but I cannot do it myself. I need your help, Chris, and all your listeners to help me as well. I love it. I love it. Laura, thanks so much for being on the show, and you have been listening to KPFT Houston.